Hello, everybody. My name is Danny Le. I am a librarian here at the Santa Clara City Library. And tonight we have a wonderful guest tonight. Usha Sridevasan is a trained classical Indian dancer and passionate about using her arts to strength, strengthen the community. She's a Knight Foundation Creative Community Fellow and a member of the Multicultural Arts Leadership Institute cohort in San Jose, California. She has served on the board of World Arts West, the producer of famous San Francisco Epic Dance Festival, and on the City of Santa Clara's Cultural Commission, and on the board of Wildlife Rescue Palo Alto. She is the managing head of Mosaic America and leads impact strategy for women in STEM, an initiative at MKF that helps empower women and girls in STEM fields. She is also runs a consulting practice providing product strategy and marketing services to high-tech companies in Silicon Valley. She holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute and an MBA from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. Woo! Without further ado, give it up for Usha. What's up, Usha? How you Thank doing? You. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Um, man, basically, so how are you doing? How are you and your loved ones doing during this last few years of the pandemic? And you know, tell us what sort of mental health practices have you been implementing in your life during this time? Yeah. Well, um, my family and I are doing very well. Thank you for asking. I know. Um, um, compared to a lot of other people who have been through tremendous um, turbulence and upheaval during COVID and personal loss and tragedy, I think um, we've been very fortunate. Um, I get to work from home like always. My husband gets to work from home, which is a big change. So he doesn't travel, which means he can run all the errands and pick up kids and do all of that stuff. Um, the kids are back in school. We are all healthy. You know, I have my elderly parents who live with me and um, they are doing well. So I have a lot to be very grateful for. Um, in terms of what it's done in term for mental health, I mean, it's always a struggle to keep in mind um, the things that we need to do to balance our lives, to um, take care of ourselves. Um, I have to say that as I've gotten older, I've kind of gained perspective. And I think during COVID, especially when we all came so close to losing so much that we valued. Um, I think I've gotten a little bit better about appreciating what I have. Um, like a lot of people, I think um, I'm very motivated and driven by the things that I seek that I don't have, but I've never been very good about cherishing the things that I have achieved. So it's always been like, you know, set a goal, go out there and achieve it. But the, the kind of bloom goes off the rose very quickly. And then you set another goal and it's just pursuit after pursuit. And, um, you know, like somebody said, right, happiness is not just getting all the things you love, it's loving the things that you have. And I think the pandemic has helped me uh, realize that. Um, we've had a lot of loss in extended families. We see that all around us. So I think it, um, and I think this is the once in a generation kind of experience for most of us. And hopefully we will maintain this perspective and not go back entirely to the way things were. So uh, yeah, so I'm practicing gratitude um, and I can't say that I'm always in the best mental health, but I, um, I have a loving family and that helps a lot. Um, I'm grateful that you, you mentioned that uh, of pacing oneself to realize what uh, the individual or the, the self has done to yeah. celebrate those. Um, I actually recently this week had that same uh, kind of lecturing from a friend said, you know, you should celebrate what you've done. You know, right. you, you don't take time to thank yourself for all that hard work. Right. Um, right. You know, not in a very cocky way, but it's, I think I forget and leave it to the side and go on to the next project without giving myself that space yeah. to, you know, respect yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of that is just the way you're raised. You know, I was, when you're raised in an environment where your parents are trying to motivate you to achieve something because that is your path out of whether it's poverty or whatever it is, um, there is a, this fear that allowing yourself to give yourself credit will make you complacent and will take the edge off of your competitiveness or, you know, so I suddenly grew up in a family where we never got congratulated for kind of, you know, being first in class or winning something, you know, just go, go, go. But at some point, I think we need to realize at some point in life that that becomes counterproductive. It is 
perfectly possible for you to still be driven and still be motivated and high achieving and uber competitive um, while also enjoying and savoring the things that you have achieved. And I think that's the balance we need to reach. So. Um, you know, you segued into my, you know, next question is, uh, can you share a little bit about your upbringing? You know, um, what kind of environment that was, you know, the, whether the family and also the environment that you had to persevere through to get to where you're at today. Cause definitely I see an amazing, powerful woman before me, but let me, let's talk about who that younger self was who got to this point, you know? Thank you. Um, so I come from a town, a city in Southern India, and I was raised in what I would say is a, a lower middle class, um, family, you know, it was just my sister and I and my, both my parents worked and um, I was, but I was raised in a very traditional environment and probably being prepared for a very traditional life, which involved maybe just kind of getting a civil services job and then getting married and living close to my parents and, you know, that kind of environment. Certainly, I don't think I was raised with this intent that I would go away to a faraway place and lead a very different kind of life. But, um, I, I, you know, growing up in, in 70s and 80s back in India, it's very much a patriarchal society. And I was fortunate enough to have not only very strong role models in the women in the family, I had a dad who is the feminist in our family, right? And so, um, yeah, and he was very determined to make sure that his daughters did not um, ever live their lives as just somebody's daughter, somebody's wife, somebody's mother, but kind of are independent women that make their own choices and chart their own course. And so um, I was very fortunate to have that kind of family. And, um, but still, I mean, I think um, some of those things that we all grew up with, you know, and you probably can relate the emphasis on academic achievement to the exclusion of everything else. I mean, I literally, you know, now I'm kind of steeped in the arts growing up. I literally did nothing other than study and cram for exams and, and um, go to college. You know, we had a roadmap and the roadmap meant you did certain things and went to engineering school or you went to med school. I went to engineering school um, and that was our ticket. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I grew up in a very, very loving um, traditional family and, uh, and not only my family, but it was my extended family of aunts and uncles and um, cousins. And, you know, so I think that was a very wonderful foundation and I still enjoy and cherish all of that. Um, now you mentioned that, you know, with, uh, you know, your family supporting everything you've done, um, was there, you know, societal pressure to have to stay in one way. Because when I look at you now during with Mosaic America and all the things that you uh, currently uh, engage in, um, it is a very uh, mixed plate of styles of influences and uh, people of different disciplines. But growing up, um, was there any kind of uh, influence to you know, break out of that, you know, need for, it seems like education was on the forefront, but right. we're talking about also that you, you know, you trained and your discipline in classical Indian dance. So when did the arts come into play in your life? That's a fascinating question. I think, um, you know, I was on autopilot following a recipe for success, however you define it back home, that was about kind of getting, becoming an engineer and going to grad school and getting a job. Um, I never really sat down and examined in my earlier life what my true passions were, right? So I got my undergraduate degree in engineering. Then I came to the US to pursue actually a PhD in electrical engineering. I just hated my where I went to the weather, where I went to school. So I commuted <laughs> my master's and I worked as an engineer for four or five years, got my green card, then went to business school, which was my way of actually pivoting because I, I you know, being an engineer wasn't what I was passionate mm. about. Um, and really it was only in my early to mid thirties when I had my first kid and I was, um, that I really even started to sit and ponder about what is it that I really want to do. And um, I was happy post business school doing product management, not necessarily you know, engineering, but still being in the high tech realm, still following a well-established you know, path 
uh, it wasn't until probably in my early 40s that I started to kind of, um, first of all, wake up and look around and see, oh, this, you know, I always assume that I'd go back to India. A lot mm. of immigrants who come here at first, right, mm. don't leave India thinking I'm going to make my home in America and, and that's going to be where I spend the rest of my life. I certainly didn't. It was always like, I'm going to go there for grad school. After grad school, I'm going to work. You always kept in the back of your mind this notion you'll go back to India. But um, before you know it, you know, you live here, you bought a house, you have two kids that are American kids. And there's no, and the India that you left behind doesn't exist anymore. It's changed and moved on. The people that you loved have grown old, some have passed on. Uh, it only exists in your memories, right? And so that was when I, I would say in my early 40s is when I just kind of woke up and started examining, you know, where am I? Who am I? What does it mean to be an Indian American? What does it mean to my kids to be Indian American? Um, and that was when I also felt the need to connect to my roots through the arts. In fact, my daughter and I started learning dance together. So I wasn't trained as a professional dancer. It was a pursuit that I took later on in my life. And around this time is when I started to realize is that the same um, kind of uh, pride that I take in my own cultural roots and the art forms that, um, you know, that belong to uh, us as Indians, every other community that makes this place home has the same kind of diversity and pride in their heritage and their arts and cultural expression. And that became very clear to me, especially when I served on the board of the Ethnic Dance Festival. You know, we have so many distinct communities of, um, that practice their music, dance, poetry, whatever form of art, cuisine, um, and they're all rich and varied and beautiful on their own, but we all kind of live in our silos and practice them separately. And uh, somehow waiting for us all to become American, you know, and I think mm, mm, this mm. where, so my, um, this is when I started to realize that, you know, it was important for me to break out of those silos, to kind of figure out, um, you know, how can we kind of all come together and realize the true glory of America? And um, I think, and I always talk about this because my co-founder Priya Das and I, both, she's also Indian American, grew up in a similar kind of background in a different place. I think one of the advantages that we had coming from uh, India, especially the India that we grew up in, which is quite different from the India of today. The India we grew up in was in a very kind of, um, it was post-independence. There was this real patriotism and unity that came from, um, and if you grew up in India in any kind of metropolitan city, the amount of diversity in a five square mile radius was just mind boggling, right? In terms of the religions, caste, subcaste, cuisines, languages, and yet um, we coexisted mm. quite not, we did more than coexist, right? we, we thrived, right? Um, we all had great cultural competency. We knew what to say to a neighbor who was a Christian versus a neighbor who was a Muslim. And so we had that model in our minds that it is possible for us to be very diverse and express and own our diversity um, and still all have a national identity, right? Versus somehow here in America, it seemed to me that diversity was viewed, even though we pay lip service to kind of diversity being great and, and all that, diversity is viewed as a division, that somehow diversity is messy. You know, people say things like, I don't see color. I don't see differences. Well, why don't you see differences? Differences are beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so having that model of kind of the Indian model of the circa 1970s that we grew up in um, gave us kind of a roadmap or a recipe for community building, for celebrating diversity, for coming together um, through the arts. And that's how Mosaic was born. So I started an organization in 2013 that was very much focused on bringing Indian diasporic arts to the forefront to the main quote unquote mainstream. And then I was joined by my co-founder for Mosaic, Priya Das, and the two of us since then have really uh, worked together on this model of community building, of building social cohesion, fostering a sense of belonging in diverse communities um, through intercultural arts. So um, this was kind of in the mid, my mid 40s, and I was fortunate enough to be able to 
pivot, you know, to step away from my corporate gig um, in high tech as a product manager. manager. And um, I first started this nonprofit and now I do this full time. You know, you had mentioned the strategy consulting. I have not done a consulting gig in a while. <laughs> I am 100% <100% laughs> devoted to, to Mosaic and it takes all of my energies and I'm really excited to be where we are today. Well, you know, you would surprise me that you say you haven't done consulting, but I can hear the project manager in you and yeah. how you produce your, you know, your wonderful events and projects. Um, you know, you definitely told, shared with us how you came to uh, these points where you knew that you needed to do something to, you know, produce uh, something that reminisces of your time in India and that you saw unity. Um, I reflected, I was just reflecting on myself, like when I was, came to California for the first time from Oklahoma, where I was born, the Bay Area, how that made me feel. I was like, whenever I travel around the world, um, I always reminisce like the unity I feel has to feel like the Bay Area because yes. this is the first place I saw so many different ethnicities just playing with each other, sharing and um, just having fun, you know, the, the Bayness attitude and feeling. But um, that's what my work is also reflective of. I was like, if we can't have this kind of unity and sharing, uh, I want it always. So I will, you know, profess to push it out. Um, luckily, I do that in the library space with <laughs> and having people like you share your work in life. Um, do you ever feel like when you're producing these shows uh, and these events and meeting uh, stakeholders, right? Do you feel the enormity and the stress and, uh, and you know, how the fear of having to live up to what you're asking yourself to do, you know? You know, when we first started this, uh, the Mosaic programming, right? Um, to some extent, it, when you're starting any venture, you almost have to be a little bit foolhardy and, and ignorant of the risks. You just have to go out there and try, right? Because if you sit there and ponder the implications of it or the enormity of what you have, um, you, you'd be paralyzed by it. I think we just embarked on this journey and said, you know, let's just try out this. Um, wouldn't it be cool if we could get people from different cultures to come together through the arts? And once you bring artists together, the audiences will come together. And Priya was like, okay, let's try it. So we, we tried, we launched Mosaic in November, 2016. And then we, you know, this is where both of us coming from the high tech world, uh, from a very agile product development um, world helped because we were unafraid to try something. Mm. And then if something didn't work out, we just go back to the drawing board, right? Nothing was too sacred. The only things that were sacred to us is respecting all communities equally mm. and allowing people to come as they are. Um, you know, we go, we meet people, whether it's artists or culture bearers or audiences, where they are, rather than ask them, say, you know, we are going to create something beautiful, come and behold what we've created, right? This is about us meeting people where they are and finding ways to commune with them. Um, so initially, you know, we were just like, you know, idealistic and excited. Um, and suddenly now, I think we do feel like we are, so think, think about it as a startup metaphor, right? We have this unique, innovative, um, the equivalent of technology, this approach to, to community building through the arts, uh, through intercultural arts. We have proven through our prototypes and initial releases that, they're, that it works. We know there's a product market fit. We see this right now. You know, we, for example, the festival, you were there um, recently. You see that we are able to foster that sense of inclusion and belonging and be able to delight people. And um, now we know it is. So now our question becomes, how do you scale this, mm -hmm. right? And the way we scale this is really making our work. If we decided that it was going to just be an organization that we need to staff up, that's going to be daunting. But our idea is we want to launch a movement, mm -hmm. right? Mosaic is a grassroots movement. Um, and movements have a way of gathering momentum and building in very short period of time. So everything that we have done so far, we have uh, kept in mind that it's not about Usha and Priya and our team, like Gladi and Malika and other people on here, 
it's not about scaling that to be 100, 200, 400 people. It's about launching mosaics all over the country by proving that the model works and then sharing those best practices, those guiding principles for um, creating mosaics in different places. And so I feel, if anything, very energized, very excited because I feel like we have the right team. Um, we have tremendous interest among our volunteers. And I feel that we have a roadmap for taking Mosaic beyond Silicon Valley in the next three years. And hopefully, eventually, you know, every diverse place in America will have a Mosaic movement that is active in community building through the arts. It's funny that you use uh, tech terminology. And I don't know, uh, it, it, it is funny because I, I use it too if I work and uh, have experience working in startup culture. But um, sometimes that language, it makes sense, especially for stakeholders who wish to understand, you know, if they're not privy to the arts, but they're like, I like this. How do I support? I mean, how many partners have you had over the last few years? I know it's over 30. About yeah, yeah. Have a lot. yeah, yeah. And that's the, you know, this would not be possible without um, partners, right? Our, the way we work is and by partners, this is artists, culture bearers, these are people that operate venues, museums, libraries, schools, um, parks, right? So on the one hand, we are taking um, these wonderful artists and culture bearers from different communities, which is like, a, you know, our, our cultural assets. We are bringing them together um, to create works of art that not only entertain, but also educate and elevate right, that allow people to see not only the diversity, but the common threads that bind us. But then we are bringing that programming to where people already gather for whatever purpose, mm -hmm. right? So people interface and individual interfaces with the community, either, um, you know, at school, at work, at, in parks, in places of worship, at the museum, all of those places are places where we can take our, um, our programming. And so what we've done systematically is um, to create those partnerships. And we also, you know, realize that the partnership has, you know, in the short term, you can pull off a partnership in which you win and the other person, you know, doesn't. Yeah. But we also know that the basis for long-term sustainable partnerships is finding alignment in our, you know, and finding mutually beneficial things that we can, go, uh, we can aspire to. And uh, that's one of the beautiful things about Mosaic. Our programming allows artists to expand their audiences, right? Think about a folkloric dancer who has traditionally only performed for their own audience, all of a sudden now performing to a broader audience because we are bringing folkloric dancers together with Indian folk dancers. So that's an audience expansion that those artists value. And then when we bring them to a museum where historically the audience has been white, the patrons and, and donors have been white, all of a sudden you see new people coming through the doors of the museum that are actually drawn to the museum because of the folk dances into the Indian or, or Mexican folkloric course. So we, we design our mosaic programming, our outreach efforts to, um, to really create these win-win situations. And that has helped us build our partnerships. I mean, in... If you did, was there, if you weren't at the Mosaic uh, Festival, I I wish you hope you go to the next one, because I not only was I a host, but I was witness to seeing so many groups of different cultures on stage from dance and music, and you know I've been to many cultural festivals, but the fact that in, in this short amount of time, six hours, there's so much activity, and I that I've experienced in that time that I have never experienced, you know, over spurts of over years, it was like, how did they do this? I, I still wonder how y'all did it, you know? Yeah. We have to thank our program, you know, VP of programming strategy, Priya Das, right? So uh, we always joke that I go out there and work hard to bring the money and she, she <laughs> spends it. <laughs> but the truth is that she works incredibly hard um, to go out and, and meet and build those relationships. Because one thing to keep in mind is, even though we call ourselves a festival, historically festivals that, um, that feature kind of quote unquote ethnic mm -hmm. arts, um, they still don't actually um, give the artists the agency to showcase their art in the manner that um, puts them in the best light. 
So uh, oftentimes the organizers say, this is our stage. These are the conditions. You will be given 10 minutes to perform. Come in your best shiniest costume. We would like for you to the lighting to be a certain way and take it or leave it, right? Because we have the audience, we have the power. If you want your art form to be showcased, you have to fit yourself into this mold. But that's not how we operate, right? So a lot of work that Priya puts into figuring out the programming in the festival is, is making sure that we are respectful of the different cultures, that we um, present them in the right context. Uh, we don't make it kind of like a gimmicky little curiosity. It's not a cultural safari, right? So that is um, that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of work, right? We, if we don't want this to be like international day at school, which is like, here comes Mexico, here comes India. And of course I come in and I only watch my kid perform and then I hightail it out of there, right? Um, this time at the festival, we actually didn't get to do as much of the collaborative stuff that we normally do because of COVID. Um, we weren't able to have the rehearsals and so on. But I think what, I, what we wanna do is, uh, we are always guided by this principle of all of us belong equally, right? We all have to come together and organize ourselves into a beautiful mosaic. And hopefully you got a sense of that, but it's, it's a lot of work, but it's work that we build these long-term relationships with artists um, and communities. And some of the communities have been um, reticent in the past to work with presenters who have not been respectful of their traditions. Um, and, you know, we, we are very mindful of that, that it's a privilege to be able to work with artists and culture bearers. And, um, you know, in order to maintain that, we have to always be respectful and treat them as peers and partners. Um, I definitely saw um, the, your ability and especially the whole, your whole team giving many of these creatives and uh, organizations their, the agency to do them wholly yeah. without any restrictions and also the opportunity to give their own equity into it you know um they did come into it with a yes so there is a uh, faith they gave have given you to say yes i want to be a part of this you know it was a hot day i'll be i'll remember that it was a hot day i was wearing a black yeah. t-shirt i don't know what i was what i was doing but <laughs> everybody was patient uh hundreds of hundreds of people came it was just beautiful um yeah. And being seeing the Mexican Heritage Plaza activated in such a manner um, was it's a joy a, to me. Yeah, it's a beautiful space. East San Jose, you know, big shout out to East San Jose, right? If there is a center of gravity for the cultures of San Jose, it really is East San Jose. And um, Mexican Heritage Plaza is a gem. The School of Arts and Culture is a great partner. They are the seat of the Multicultural Arts Leadership Institute. And, you know, we should give a big shout out to them, especially um, the Multicultural Arts Leadership Institute program, which has really, um, you know, Priya, myself, you, Gladys, many of our team members um, are graduates of the program. And I think, um, you know, we have to acknowledge the work of the people that have created the right environment for folks like us, like Priya and me to come in and try out our innovative ideas, right? The soil was tilled and the seeds were sown. So I think, um, yeah, this is a great phase. I think San Jose is at the cutting edge of um, kind of diversification, demographic shifts. And I think the city of San Jose and organizations like Silicon Valley Creates, um, like San Jose Mu Museum of Art, School of Arts and Culture, Knight Foundation, they all have played a role in creating this amazing environment um, that is a great natural habitat for innovation. Um, I like that a lot because it's, we must acknowledge the many people and generations before us who, who fought for these types of expressions and opportunities. And for those who, uh, you know, invested greatly into the arts and, uh, in us, <laughs> you know, and how we benefited from, uh, you know, that leadership and that support and, you know, and hopefully we're giving that also to the next generation. Because uh, yeah. I, I definitely want to talk about your amazing team. You, uh, when I arrived at the festival, uh, and we mentioned you were talking earlier, you had about ninety volunteers and staff member about you know in total. That was a lot. I didn't know who. I was like, is it? I was like, is this everybody in Mosaic? <laughs> this is crazy. Everybody oh, had a T-shirt. I was like, wow. 
This is amazing. Yeah. So talk about your team. How did they come about, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, we have um, almost all volunteer team, right? I mean, and apart from Priya and I, we have a regular core team of um, Gabby, Gladdy, a whole bunch of people that do regular functions, marketing, operations, events, like Erin is our event queen. Um, but then we also, over the past, especially during COVID, we hosted a lot of online events which allowed us to reach people, a lot more people than we would with just physical events. And um, a lot of them having experienced our programming, we're willing to sign up to be volunteers. Um, I think the mosaic mission and vision really motivates people, especially once they've actually seen our programming and they know, um, you know the kind of feeling that it evokes, the emotion it evokes in them. Um, so we have a lot of volunteers that signed up. Um, we have a couple of uh, youth groups that came to us um, and some schools that sent in volunteers. So it was really fabulous. It was wonderful to have that many people. Um, and, you know, we have also this creative um, brand agency that we worked with, WeSpark. Um, they have a lot of experience with um, large events. And so they brought that expertise as well. Um, and I think I'm particularly proud of the fact that we were, despite all of that, able to keep um, the festival free of uh, cost to people. And that was very important to us, is uh, to raise funds on the back end through, you know, foundations and others, just so that we can then make it free for everybody. Because the minute it becomes a ticketed event, you raise the barrier uh, for a lot of people and families. So accessibility was key yeah. but definitely when you made it free and and the value that everybody experienced oh my gosh um I felt like yeah I, that's why I started buying things and eating things because <laughs> I was like this has to be paid back in one way or form yeah um yeah. I mean uh, you talk about uh people's willingness to uh, volunteer and give their time and energy uh into Mosaic America's Festival and all your work but can you, can you, do you think really uh, that also this time in uh, our nation and in our world uh, because of the pandemic and a lot of other um, societal issues have been happening that we need the arts, that we need that kind of collective uh, sharing again uh, to, and to express and show, as you say, our mosaic of uh, diversity, uh, mm -hmm. but that we all are the same, we are one and we should show all our colors. Um, can you speak more on uh, what do you think the future holds for not just your work, but the Bay Area and beyond? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think there is a couple of things that trouble me about the Bay Area. And um, I'll also explain why I think the arts are probably a great way to counter these trends. You know, I just saw yesterday, I think, another survey that says a majority of people living in the Bay Area, especially in Santa Clara County, don't see themselves living here in the long term. Mm. You know, they, for what, various reasons, and most of them will cite the cost of housing and transportation and all of that stuff as reasons for them to move out. But when you think about the overarching dynamics in San, um, Santa Clara County, uh, almost 50% of the people who live here right now were not born here, right? They were born elsewhere. A vast majority were born overseas. Many of them came like me to this country as adults. And um, we, we don't really have roots here. And oftentimes we don't have, don't know the history of the land, yeah. right? So when we come here, we first of all, very focused on our professional achievements. Um, and we, when we become citizens, we are required to take a civics test, but not a history test. So a lot of them don't know the history of the land. And as a result, we don't have an appreciation for the people that settled and created the society we live in right now. That's one problem. The other problem is that we don't have nearly as many shared experiences because we silo ourselves. So as an Indian American, I may go to work and at work, I have a lot of people from very diverse backgrounds, but I don't express my cultural identity. I just, mm -hmm. I go there as a software engineer or product manager or QA test, what have you. Then I come back home and I'm just off there doing things with my community, right? And I define my community as Indian American and that could be said for other communities as well. So you don't have roots here, you don't have history here, you don't have shared experiences together. And on top of that, so both of those explain why people really don't feel a connection to the place, mm. which is why you see people, um, companies even, right? Like Tesla or whatever, 
sorry, you know, I don't like yeah. the terms that you're offering me, so I'm going to go set up headquarters somewhere else. Um, and I think that for me, that's troubling. But I think the way we reverse that is by creating shared experiences in the present, which is kind of what we do. But not just shared experience. Right now, the only shared experiences happening oftentimes in many places is when I go to like, I live in Saratoga, and when I go to you know, the city council meeting, especially if there is an item there that has to do with either school or tax or development, that's when you see the full community turn out in all its glorious diversity, right? <laughs> Short of that, you do not see <laughs> diversity in gathering places. So I think that um, getting people together to experience uplifting um, things like through the arts or anything else, is key, right? And then doing it repeatedly in different environments. Um, and that I think is a great way for us to foster a sense of kind of a shared future. But there's the other thing that we also do, and Priya and I feel very strongly about this, is we commission works that are very intentional about drawing attention to the history of the land. Mm -hmm. And not, and history oftentimes is written by those, by the victors, right? When you read the history books about Native Americans or Ohlone, oftentimes, you know, it's written by the victors. And so they leave out portions or they may um, distort facts. So for us, it's important that the history be told by the communities that own it, that have experienced it. So, but we feel like by allowing those stories to be told through the arts, especially multicultural arts, we are able to create a shared understanding of history, which is important. So for example, we have um, we had this program that we funded last year and it was actually 2019 called Precious Scars. And the idea was to tell the story of Japanese American internment through music composed by Japanese American, Muslim American and uh, Mexican American composers and to be performed by musicians from those cultures. And the reason we picked that is even though the Japanese American internment may have only affected Japanese Americans, the same xenophobia that was the cause of that persists through other and, and affects other communities as well. And yet a lot of people, including people like myself, have no knowledge of that. We don't share that chapter in history. So, I think that the way we can move forward and, and create a, a, a strong sense of our identity in Bay Area and Silicon Valley um, is by creating these shared experiences and coming up with ways in which we can all uh, have a shared understanding of our past so that we can have a shared vision for the future. Mm, I, I love it. I love it all. I love it all. Um, I mean, I just think because for many uh, different communities, the talk of the past uh, is painful. Um, mm -hmm. it, it is it, it's often not s spoken out loud or shared because uh, to re revisit that is, means to go back in that time period. Usually my elders uh, or even my family members who will choose not to speak on uh, what has happened. But I think the beauty of how I've learned other cultures was through new interpretations of that past through the arts, you know, a healing through, from that pain. I mean, uh, through the art, it would, you know, show what has happened to that uh, group, but uh, it shows the, the potential future um, yes. in, in many different ways. And uh, that I witnessed through the festival is that uh, we're making our no, new uh, legacies, new yes. myths, you know, it's beautiful. Um, and I'm just grateful to see what's ahead for, uh, everything you have to do. So do you have anything to share in the pipeline uh, coming up? You know, cause uh, we're always interested in hearing. Yes, you. thank you. Um, first of all, I would love to say, and I'm, um, all of you can follow us on social media by just uh, finding us at Mosaic America or to our website mosaicamerica.org. That's the best way for you to kind of get updates on the events that we have, or, you know, get updates on the projects that we have in the hopper. On November 1st, uh, we are premiering another commissioned work that was funded in part by City of San Jose and California Arts Council. And um, it's called Music in Memoriam. And the idea is, um, you know, death and mourning rituals um, 
abound in all cultures, right? Every culture has its own version of it. Um, so this is an evening length musical presentation that is led by Ray Furuta, who is uh, uh, a concertizing uh, solo flutist. He's a professor at, uh, at SCU as well as San Jose State University. Uh, and he leads this ensemble called Common Sounds Ensemble. He's also our mosaic music director. So he basically um, is, is working with five different composers from different cultural backgrounds um, to compose new works anywhere between three to 10 minutes, they vary, that are inspired by um, you know, death and mourning rituals. Or um, So we're kind of bringing all of that together in one evening length performance at San Jose Women's Club on November 1st, it's called Music in Memoriam. And um, it is essentially think of it as a multicultural um, cele musical celebration of Dia de los Muertos. So um, that's happening on November 1st and we're very, we're very excited for that. And um, we have our annual, every year we help a mark uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day um, in January with School of Arts and Culture. And then we have a whole bunch of new works that we are planning to premiere for Black History Month. So stay tuned. And you know the best way for you guys to keep, um, to get updates is to join us on social media. Also, if you send an email to info at mosaicamerica.org, we'll add you to our mailing list. And um, that's a great way to, to um, get the latest. And uh, now I know why you make sure this is your full time, because I can't imagine you doing anything more than this or you'll go insane for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, grateful that, uh, you know, person like you is uh, spearheading all this because we need more individuals like you helping create new art, new works, new voices to emerge from our community and to see possibility in their own uh, practices. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love it. And, and that's what makes me mad because if I miss a show, I know it's not <laughs> filmed. So if you miss it, you're like, ah, well, I don't know if we'll do that anytime soon again. So I do definitely hope everybody out there get your tickets, you know, look at your calendars, make some time to invest yeah. in that uh, experience, something that will probably change you for the, for the best. Um, any, before we get off any shout outs, uh, you know, any last words or something, you know, for the people out there. Sure. Um, you know, first of all, I have to say a, a huge thanks to our team, uh, my, my co-founder Priya Das, and then my wonderful, wonderful, uh, mosaic team of volunteers and I'm not going to list names because I will forget somebody and then it would yeah. be bad but they are extremely devoted they're all driven by the mission right nobody's in the arts to make any money right um, <laughs> I know <laughs> right um, but these are folks that are um, you know just so devoted to the cause and um, are so giving of their time and their skills and we are grateful um, and if any of you on this call is eager to volunteer and become part of the team, please send us a note at um, info at mosaicamerica.org. So that's the first shout out. Um, and then I would love to like, I think I already mentioned the institutions and um, you know people, the advocates for the arts in the community like uh, Roy and PJ Hirabayashi of San Jose Taiko, Tamara Alvarado, um, who's now at Packard Foundations, you know, all the wonderful folks at the School of Arts and Culture, the Arts Commissions. Also, Cynthia, uh, who's right in Borges, who used to be actually at in City of Sunnyvale. She introduced us to the city and we came in and, and programmed there. And then after that, she introduced us to Santa Clara City Library. So, um, so many people to give thanks to. And our board um, is wonderful, supportive, a working board. Um, funders, so Knight Foundation, Silicon Valley Creates, the Packard, Hewlett Foundation, a lot of people that are, have put their money and their trust in a small fledgling organization. You know, we, we are entirely virtual, almost all volunteer led um, and fairly new, you know, and, and so um, I think we are onto something, but it's so great to see the funders support us in this journey. So thanks to all of you and thanks to you. Um, thank you to all the folks that joined us today. Yeah. Any questions, anybody? I'm happy to answer if you have Yeah, questions. we got a few moments, maybe for uh, one or two questions. If you want to put it in the chat, I'll read it out or Q&A. Um, yeah. But right now is your chance not to be shy. 
yes. otherwise. So give you a moment to think of something, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me here. Oh no, it's a it's a joy. And what we do here, at libraries, as I told you, we share stories, and wow. this this is quite a great story today. So I'm I'm taking something home to sleep uh, good tonight on, you know. Thank you. I mean, libraries are um, an amazing place for so many reasons, right? And I think. Um, we worked, for example, at Saratoga Library. We've done Santa Clara City Library. Um, there's just a whole host of libraries that we are planning to, to enlist in our partner programs because you do see people of all ages, you know, all backgrounds come through there. And um, we're just a, a natural place for us to, to bring our programming. Just know that I'm an advocate and I will shout you to all the other libraries and army of librarians to help you out with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madhu. And thank you, Ginger. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions, I'm going to just go ahead and put my email and other information in chat, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Put that in. Um, I and mean, then nobody really has questions. Uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Yeah. But, uh, but thank, thank you, you, everybody, for just being here. You know, um, it's, it's very yeah. exciting. And I do hope if you wish to uh, share your practices uh, and if you have uh, opportunities, you know, contact uh, yes. Isha or myself at the Santa Clara City Library because we're here for collaboration. We're here to help one another. And I like to manifest those things yes. and Thank opportunities you, in the future. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. This is great. I also love the, the work that you're doing and kind of sourcing new books from new authors that reflect our beautiful diversity. Um, thank you for all the hard work. I'm just a nerd. I'm just a big nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and uh, and a gamer, right? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I didn't even mention that, but you see it too. So yeah, I do. I, do. <laughs> I have to say, I'm a pretty lame gamer. I just, uh, I think the last game I played was Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. My little, you know, x86 computer. So <laughs> thank you, Gladdy. Um, All right. Well, you know, everybody, uh, no questions. I'm sure you privately will tell her in the future. But thank you for joining us for this talk. Thank you for sharing your <laughs> night with us. And if always, uh, please be well, uh, take care of one another. And we will see you at the next Mosaic event or in the library. So Madhu had a quick question. Down oh, there, sure, sure. Here, I'll reverse that. Yeah, so um, Madhu's question was, is your November 1st program virtual? Thank you for the question. It's actually going to be in person, and um, but we will require all our attendees to show proof of vaccination as well as wear a mask. So um, yeah, thank you for asking that question. And actually, if it's OK, I'm going to share um, the event link. I should have kind of done this. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I should have gotten this done earlier. Ah, it's all good, you know? Yeah, let me drop it in the link here. Um, there we go. Make sure to save that if you haven't seen it in the chat. You know, there's a link for the event. Um, November 1st definitely sounds like it's going to be. It's going to be amazing. awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, we have free tickets for seniors and students. Um, and then the rest of the tickets are pretty inexpensive, $10. Um, ahead so please join us we'd love to have you there thank you guys all right bye, bye thank you for answering the question so once again be well usha i'll see you soon eventually we'll talk. thank you danny <laughs> bye 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 Take care everybody